Hi, my name is Ayman. I'm a business growth specialist. I'm going to talk to you today about why your startup is not, as, is not growing as much as you want it to. We're going to be together for around less than 30 minutes and I'll open it up towards the end to answer some questions. And um, on Instagram, I share a lot of information about uh, business growth and tactics and things that I see in business. And uh, also, in, uh, I have a podcast in Arabic about, about business as well, if you're into podcasts. For next week, we're talking about building a customer care system for SMEs. So if you're a startup or an SME looking to grow your business, and um, the topic of next week is a customer care system and what to do for retention and how to address that and how to structure your team and so on. Um, uh, I'll be sharing the link in the, uh, in the chat as well for you to register. And that's the topic for next week. One core concept that I always try to raise awareness on is that defining success. How do we define a successful business? Not all businesses are unicorns. A lot of the people who start a business, it's either, you know, we're going to build the next Facebook or we're not going to build anything. Um, there's nothing wrong with building a business that generates revenue of $2 million a year and a net profit of 40%. I came across uh, this post on social media um, and, and this is a common uh, topic I see in terms of what we define as a successful business. So uh, this is an example of somebody who moves, moves items in a house and he generates a thousand dollars a day. It doesn't have to be an innovative idea. It doesn't have to be based on blockchain and artificial intelligence. There are many different businesses that, that can be done. And the objective is to have a significant amount of profit that can allow you to live, uh, that can compensate you for the work that you're doing and can help you build the business and moving forward. So there's no need to think about if I don't achieve uh, uh, a, an exit of eight, nine, 10 digits, that means I failed uh, as an entrepreneur. Um, the stories of an Instagram selling for $700 million in less than two years with only 14 employees, <coughs> probably less. Uh, that's the exception. So don't, when you look at those YouTube videos or those articles, that is the exception, not the rule. Because for every uh, exception of Instagram, there are hundreds of thousands of failing businesses. I speak with business owners all the time. Even before COVID, they've had issues with COVID that exposed and accelerated their issues. Um, so don't fall in love with the headlines. And um, I don't know if you're into lottery tickets or not. Some people buy them because of the statistics, others do not. But building a business is much, much more difficult than just you know paying a few dirhams to buy a, a lottery ticket. So the unicorn is the exception of the rule. Another aspect when I see in terms of a mindset is it's based on raising money. So I see many businesses, they go from um, one race, their focus and their obsession is to go from one race to the other. So their focus is on getting their business ready for their next round of, of funding. So as soon as they raise money now, they might raise money that can last them 12 months, eight months, 18 months. Within four or five months, they also start to prepare for their next uh, raising round. It cannot be the success indicator because raising money is debt. So it's money you have to give back and you have to give back 10 times. So money that you borrow from the bank, you give back at 3%, 6%, 7%, depending on the interest rate. But money you give back from VC is, is expected to be 10 times as much. It cannot be success indicator. The profitability of the business is, not all businesses require venture capital. I understand a lot of businesses are intensive in terms of inventory or R&D and so on, but that's not all businesses. So, because I talk with many founders and the first thing they want to do is when they have their idea or the initial part of the business is they want to go out and race because they need the money. Not all businesses require venture capital. And also the concept of if I raise money then, that's also the same as I apply to myself is if I had more time, I would work out. I would eat better. If I had more time, I'd spend more time with fun. But if I then. So that mindset is also not helping. <laughs> There's a quote that stuck with me. I read this quote back in 1990. Um, 
there was DOS, that was long before Windows even. There was a book I read, it had a quote in it that says, you'll never have enough money, time, or memory. What the amount of memory is RAM for running a system, but it stuck with me that we will never have enough money, time, or memory. So that's why raising funds is not the answer uh, to uh, building and growing the business. Uh, a key concept that I always uh, repeat awareness on is unit economics. Uh, and that is the sign of a healthy business. So the unit economics means how much does it cost you to make? How much does it cost you to acquire the customer? And how much do you sell it for? Um, if you've seen Shark Tank episodes, you've seen cases where a founder comes in and they're talking. It's obvious the, the sharks are not engaged. They don't like the founder or they don't like the idea. So they're not engaged. But when they get to the part of how much money they make and what percentage profit on that, that's when you see the sharks, they sit up in their chairs, they pay more attention. And that's when they want to engage and talk to the founder that who a few minutes ago, they did not care about him or her. Because the unit economics of that business make a lot of sense. And that's what it, what's appealing to any investor or fund. So it's basically how much does it cost you to make? So let's say it costs you 30 dirhams to make a product. It costs you another 20 dirhams to acquire the customer via ads or another channel. And you sell it for 120 dirhams. So it costs you 50 between making it and acquiring a customer and you sell it for 120. So you have a 70 dirham margin on top of that. That means you have, that's the unit economics and that's the core of any business, no matter what you sell. If it's a product service, online, offline, whatever it is that you do, that's the core of your business. So if that part, if you are able to address unit economics and have a healthy unit economics, you will have a healthy business. A lot of the founders that go after venture capital, they have a poor unit economics and they're trying to, to raise money, to spend other people's money to cover their unit economics. This is why when COVID happened, you have businesses that went out in three weeks, not in three months, in three weeks. That's why. Uh, and that definitely affects, uh, and that definitely affects how the businesses run and so on. We have a question from, from Ravinder. Hi Ravinder, good to see you. If you can unmute, I, I'm happy to answer your question. Uh, or if you're more comfortable uh, sharing, uh, sharing question in the chat, uh, that also that also works. What I'm addressing in terms of the unit economics, uh, and this is an example here uh, about what it would. Uh, wh what I mean in terms of unit economics. So this is an example. This does not apply to all businesses. It's just an example of what it would look like. So this is about here when we look into a product category. So even if you have 20, 30, 50 items, 10 services that you, that you share, that you um, provide, at the end, there are three to five main revenue drivers. Here you'd look at what your cost is, what your profit margin is, uh, what's the sales price, and, and so on. And um, I'll be sharing this Excel. So at the end of this, so by tomorrow, I, I'll, uh, I'll be sending out an email with the PowerPoint that we saw at this Excel, and there's a link uh, to this Excel here, here at the bottom. So uh, I'll be sharing this with you. So here we're looking at what are the costs of the business and so on. And here you'd look at how profitable it is. So these are certain aspects here that, that we look at related to a business about how much does it cost you to make, what profit margins you have on it, what are your costs in terms of acquisition and marketing to get a customer uh, uh, and things like this. So this, these are certain elements uh, to look for in any business uh, uh, that you're looking to, uh, to, to, to sell. Another important concept is product market fit. And this applies to all founders. I've, I've advised founders who have had excellent product market fit, even if their product is not great or their offering is not great, but people want their service. So they figured out a gap that is not addressed in the market and people want that product or service and users are willing to go through um, some uh, um, 
inaccuracies. So let's say, for example, if it's not the best, so one of the customers I was advising is they've had a very, as a best practice comparison, their sign-up process is poor, but they have had one of the highest uh, uh, conversion rates of signups, conversion rates at 70%, an indicator that even if others have the best, follow the best practices, they might achieve 20%, 30%, 40% conversion. Um, this customer achieved 70%. It's because people wanted their service and they're willing to go through an annoying or less than ideal uh, uh, sign-up process. Um, and that's one indicator. So the product market fit part, when people want their service and the founders have identified this, people are willing to over, overlook certain things. While other businesses, they focus more on the best practices, but not on the product, product uh, service offering. That is still not right. And I'll talk more about how to, how to reach that stage. So the product market fit can hide, uh, can address some of the uh, other, can overcome some of the shortcomings. Another aspect for growth is the business model itself. So let's say, for example, you're in a, the services industry. Um, so I can see uh, Raisa is with us here today, for example, uh, you're in the services industry. It's very difficult in the services industry to expect it to grow as fast as a product or a technology company. It's the, it's the nature of the business itself. Because in the services industry, for example, the more business you get, the more people you need. So there's a, there's a human aspect of it. So it's not like you build a technology platform that can scale technically, and the more customers you get, you're able to grow on base of the same tech investment. So growth there is at a, at a, slower, a slower pace. So this is why the business model also can affect why, why, why it, it, cannot, it cannot grow. And for this, even me on a personal level, it took me years to, to, to come to the realization that certain business models, no matter what you try to do with them, that's their size. Of course, you have bigger sizes and so on, but then that industry itself cannot easily grow. Another aspect as well that I see a lot of businesses do is the business owners, they worry about scaling, but Ayman, this guy can't scale. Ayman, I need to scale, how do I scale? And look at their business. They've been barely in market for a few years. They have less than 100 transactions a day. They don't need to scale at this point. Scaling means you have to put in the money to build the technology infrastructure, to, build, to get the right people in place, to get the, so there's so much effort in scaling that if done too early, can really uh, affect the business and affect the growth of the business. So the money goes into depth, not growth. That also affects why I started not to grow. So the scaling part is an obsession. It's again, because I see a lot of this, these articles on the internet and, and, if it, and these YouTube videos about scaling and how important it is, it's super important, but you, you don't expect the first few years and a few employees and less than 100 transactions that you have to worry about, uh, about the scaling aspect. Culture. Culture is another aspect uh, that I feel a lot of founders uh, digress in their business growth. They focus on culture too early. If you're a small business and the staff deal with the founder almost every day or a few times a week, culture is transmitted by osmosis. If you go back to the chemistry that we took back in school, osmosis meaning that um, if, a simple thing, if you have a drop of water, uh, if you have a puddle of water and you put the paper, the water uh, goes through the paper. So, uh, so the paper absorbs the water. That is, that's an example of, of, of osmosis and it happens very organically, very naturally in the business. You don't need to extensively focus on culture because when the founder, when the founder is involved in the business in the day to day with the different members of the staff, due to proximity, they will learn from him or her how the culture of the company is, how the, founder how the founder reacts to things. If the founder is trying to cheat customers, the staff will, will, will try to cheat customers. If the founder is trying to be smart, uh, 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 you know, uh, smart in terms of cutting corners, uh, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to make a profit when, when they, when, uh, uh, in areas that, that it, uh, they can't afford to, to, to cut corners uh, from service or safety offering, the staff will do this, so the, or if they are, uh, so that is something that they can get. You have to actively adjust culture if, if the company is too big. Um, I work with founders, I started with them, there are six, seven people, and now there are 200 people organization. They don't know all of the members of the team, they're not involved in the hiring, they, they, they don't know names. 
uh, they don't know their day to days. In that case, yes, uh, you need to focus on culture. The founder needs to spend time with different department heads and different staff to, to help align the overall company on a certain culture, certain direction. But don't obsess about culture too early if you're a small business. That will move you away from your focus of growth. Another common aspect here that, as well uh, that, uh, uh, that personally annoys me is uh, founders, a lot of founders don't talk to customers directly. A lot. It could be introversion. It could be a blind belief in the power of technology. Let me send a survey and people will tell me. Um, I found founders who spend a lot of hours debating, debating how to change their product, how to change their service, uh, hours and hours and days and days, but they don't, they don't feel comfortable spending you know, 30 minutes talking to a few customers. The customers will tell you what they want in your business. They'll tell you with their wallets when they buy something. They tell you with their wallets when they cancel them working with you. And if you call and ask enough people, a lot of them will tell you, not all, but a lot of them will tell you what they're expecting from your uh, business. And listen to all of them. I'm not saying build what they want specifically 100% the way they want it, but listen to them. If, they, if you have a very common aspect, a very common theme that needs to be addressed, um, then address it. So for example, um, you've all bought online. And you look at the reviews, if you see a common theme about something that's not sturdy or is broken easily or has poor support, so it's a common theme uh, across multiple comments and that stops you from buying as a new customer. And if I was the advisor to that business or a partner of that business, I'd say, okay, look, our common issues are uh, a poor return policy, uh, problems when paying uh, or techno technical problems on, uh, an Android, uh, on Android, for example. So those are three most common aspects for us to address as a business. And then we go through each to, to do this. And that can be done by getting actual feedback from people, not hiding behind technology or hiding behind my staff, asking them to go out and, and call the people to get the feedback from customer. Because when you talk to customers and you, and you do the product market fit, the product market fit, I go back to revisit this because I've seen the founders, when they achieve product market fit, the, their business, grows much, much, much smoother. The staff know much, you know, know what, what to do much better and customers know what to buy and how to buy and why to buy. And it's a, you feel the founders are much more rested versus other founders because they know the business is working itself, itself it works. So they've achieved a good portion of the product market fit and that can be only achieved by talking to customers to understand what they want and trying the different variations of what they've asked us for to see if that works. So to, to, to start to, to narrow down or summarize towards the core component of the business for growth is acquiring the customers, executing when we, after we get the customer, executing on that, the billing and the customer retention. These are the four things to get right. So first is the operational execution before the customer acquisition. You need to be able to reliably offer a service or product. Take a small example from your own life. There are restaurants that you've been going to for the last six or seven years. The reason you go back to those restaurants again and again is because every time you go there, even the last seven years, you've been there so many times that this, anytime you go there, uh, the food is reliably in a certain level of quality. And, and that gets you there again and again. You, you've seen so many restaurants who are great in the first three months or year and then after that, they're, you know, they start to cut corners on certain things or the founder is no longer involved the way they, they used to be before. So the execution suffers and people start to come less and less. So after the operational execution, the core of the operational execution is in place. Acquiring customers is then what you move on to. How to acquire customers and ideally building internal capabilities to acquire customers, not outsourcing it to, to, to an agency, not outsourcing it to a freelancer. Uh, so getting internal capabilities for you to acquire customers, because if your execution is on point to a certain extent, it becomes a customer acquisition game. So that because the more customers you get, you throw them into the business and the operational execution is there to take care of them. So that's when you move on to customer ex execution. The billing part, the reason I add it, I used to go straight to customer retention, but then I've added the billing part because I've seen so many cases. And also I, I learned from my business and the, uh, and the shortcomings that, that I did early on is there are always billing issues. When do we bill? 
uh, our collection is it 12 days, uh, 40 days, 90 days? I know our contract says something, but then what is, what is it really? Uh, and uh, the billing is always in arrears. Invoices don't go out in time. Collection is, is delayed. Um, if I, 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 even if it's a technology-based company and, and all the transactions are there, I've seen many founders who need time to know the exact billing. They have a range of the billing, but the exact corrective billing they need weeks, and during those weeks, you have a lot of margin of error. You will not remember two weeks ago the details of a particular transaction. And this is when you get to have margins of error. And then, of course, at the end comes, comes the customer retention, where you've worked hard to acquire the customer. You've did all you can to service them, and you've properly built them. You want to make sure that they stay with you. So, And that's an area here where you have... You're, you're reactive and proactive. Reactive saying, knowing that the customer has confidence that if he or she has a problem, they know if they come to you, you will, you will find a way to properly address it. The same way you would address it for a sister or a brother or a family member. And also even better with customer retention is being proactive about this. Where uh, uh, a small example, uh, yesterday I sent out some items to a, a startup laundry, uh, a laundry startup uh, in Dubai. And then they called me up saying, you know, one of the items that has been placed in the bag uh, cannot, you know, uh, that washing and folding way will damage that product. They asked me, would I mind if I do it in a different way, a different laundry way, whatever it is, and for a fee, obviously, uh, uh, for that. So they were preemptive about it. Instead of saying, okay, it's, it's the customer's fault, they put it in this bag and let me wash it and damage it, and then I'll go to customer support and fix it later. From the beginning, they called me up and said, look, Ayman, this will be damaged. If we do it this the way that that, that that you requested, we can do it the other way, but there's going to be an additional extra demands extra. You want to do it this way? And yes, this way, I feel confident that when I send them things, they, are pro, they will take care of it. They're proactive about it and so on. My session next week is about customer retention. I'll talk about uh, tactics, about how to be proactive in solving customer, customer issues, because that will play a very big role in, in your retention. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to address questions. If there are any, I can address them now or on uh, or on Instagram later. So whatever information, uh, whatever questions that you might have, uh, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to address those. Uh, whether it's related to uh, how to acquire the customer, uh, how to uh, service them well, um, what are things standing in your way for. Uh, what are things standing in your way towards uh, acquiring that growth? What are things that, uh, if you've noticed, I focus a lot uh, uh, topics on uh, the founder uh, not digressing from core things. So focusing too early on scaling that can that can slow the growth of a startup. Focusing too early on culture that that can uh, uh, that can also affect the startup growth and so on. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, here, or if you want, uh, I can do it on Instagram later. And this is why I wanted to thank also all of you for coming in today. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you next week and answering questions in the meantime. So uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>